It's good to be meeting with you in this way, though we would love to be meeting in person. We do not know how long this shutdown will go, but we are trusting that the Lord is watching over us and that he will continue to advance his divine and eternal purposes in our hearts and in his world. Thank you for continuing to encourage one another and to reach out in blessing to one another. That is vitally important. And so let's make use of every available means to us in order to accomplish that. Would you join with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the privilege of coming before you. And indeed, our very hearts, our eyes, all that we are is set upon you. Lord, you declared that in this world there would be struggles of all different kinds. We give you thanks that you are infinitely greater than the struggles and the trials, the difficulties, all that this world has to throw at us. Lord, you are infinitely greater, and all of our rejoicing is in you. So, Lord, as we come before your word today, so bless and strengthen us, work your will, receive praise, honor, and glory. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is a bit of a transition day as we move into uh, these coming weeks. You will notice that on our website, there is the full service of this past Sunday. Pastor Jordan preached for us, and there was also the hymn singing and the scripture reading and the prayer of that in-person service. And some of you were with us for that. And so that would seem as a repeat for you. And so it is for your blessing that we are presenting this sermon only from Psalm 47, the passage which I was intending to preach on this Sunday. And so as we transition, there are these two postings coming on our YouTube site and may they both be a blessing. Whether you already heard that previous one or whether uh, you did not, may one or both of these be a strength to you. And rolling forward, next Sunday we continue with further sermons that we take out of the Psalms, and we trust that they will be a great strength for you. I'm reading from Psalm 47. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. God is gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our king. Sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. This psalm comes to us from the sons of Korah. And I have read to you out of the King James Version, though I typically preach out of the New American Standard Bible. The reason for the shift today for this message is that it just did not seem right to read any other text other than the King James Version, and here is the reason for that. More than 30, 40 years ago, perhaps, 40 years ago, 
I was a choir member, and we sang a anthem that was taken from this Psalm 47, and it was a glorious experience to have a hundred voices or more blending together in Ralph von Williams' tremendous anthem, Oh, Clap Your Hands. And that is imprinted in my memory of that experience and the rejoicing of raising our voices in praise to God. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. How I would love to sing in a choir such as I did then and to have the organ and there was trumpets that we had playing with us. It was indeed a great day. As I said, this psalm comes to us from the sons of Korah. Almost half of the psalms that we have that are specifically named, that the author is named, come to us from the hand of David, the shepherd king. But 10 of the psalms come to us from the sons of Korah. We are rather sparse in our knowledge of exactly who these were, but we are marvelously blessed to have them give us these psalms of praise. Up to this point, as we've made our way through selected psalms, we have only come to the psalms of David, but now the sons of Korah. And let me remind you or open your eyes to how we have been blessed by these men. In Psalm 42, I think you'll recognize this. Psalm 42 is the first that comes to us from the son, sons of Korah. And it's as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs and pants after you, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 46, also from the sons of Korah. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Many, many times I have used Psalm 46 in a funeral or a memorial setting and it concludes in verse 10 be still and know that I am God I will be exalted among the heathen I will be exalted in the earth the Lord of hosts is with us the God of Jacob is our refuge but our focus today is Psalm 47. Oh, clap your hands. These were excited believers in the great God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The same God who sent Jesus to die upon Calvary's cross out of the love which he had for your soul and for mine. I find that many are glum believers these days. As we have made our way through these incredibly trying times, and the end is questionably in sight, when will we come to the conclusion of this time, a strange time in each of our lives? Some who hear my voice, you have lived through such perilous times because you remember the difficulties of the dirty 30s and you remember World War II. And some of you who have come from other nations of the world, you understand that not perhaps on a worldwide scope, but especially in your world and in your city and country, there were equally devastating experiences 
which were horrible in unspeakable terms. However, I would want to bring your attention and the focus of your thoughts and eyes, the focus of your heart, I would want to bring it back to the scriptures and what it has to say. We have considered repeatedly how that David, in hard-pressed times, he sought refuge in the Lord, and his soul was comforted and strengthened. We think of David when he was hard-pressed at various times, how he strengthened himself in God. He strengthened himself in the Lord. How do you do that? You do that by quiet communion with God and through feeding upon his word, these means of God's rich grace to our hearts, things that he has given for us to be built up in him. Here, I would want you to hear this. This is not a psalm which is only reserved for those glad occasions when we say, oh, everything is going great. Now, because we feel so built up, let's turn to Psalm 47. Here is a psalm which is rightly our focus, and these words are rightly in our mouths as well when we are not on the top of the mountain and when things are not going perfectly well when the sea is not glass smooth, but rather when the waters are choppy and when the clouds are dark and looming and when we wonder whether there is a hurricane or a tornado or a storm of devastating consequence about to sweep down upon us, a storm of whatever kind. The sons of Korah they ascribe this to the chief musician. That chief musician was not the king of Israel, whoever that might have been in that day, but it was the Lord himself, the one who places music in the heart and the one who causes the beggar to sing, who causes the orphan and the widow to rejoice he is the one who can place music in the heart when everyone else says, wow, you really do have it rough. You really do have reason to complain. But the chief musician is the one who does wondrous things so that this world all of a sudden loses. It loses the pull upon us when it would want to drag us down. Oh, clap your hands, these sons of Korah cry out and sing out. Clap your hands, all ye people. They're not just calling for those who are feeling good, but they're calling for the entire congregation to join with them and to shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Over the past weeks and months, I have repeatedly considered John chapter 16 and verse 33. Perhaps you're getting a little weary of me referring to this. It's immediate, it's the last verse before Jesus prays the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17, and then he leads his disciples out to the Garden of Gethsemane over, uh, over the Kidron Valley at Kidron Brook. Jesus has been investing into his disciples. He's been pouring into them. It starts with John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. 
And Jesus speaks to them of the Holy Spirit that he would send in the Father's name that would come and dwell within each believer and would take that Holy Spirit, would take the things of Christ and make them vividly, vibrantly real to each one. And Jesus, he draws it to this conclusion. John chapter 16, verse 33, he's forewarning the disciples of what is to come. He says, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. And he says, in the world ye shall have tribulation. Plainly, simply put, you're going to have rocky paths and stormy seas you are going to have tribulation in this world. But he wants to lift their eyes and he wants them to see this. He says, be of good cheer. Clap your hands and rejoice, as Psalm 47 says. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph, is essentially what Jesus is saying. He says, be of good cheer. Good cheer, I have. It's not, I'm going to overcome the world, but Jesus says, it is so sure an accomplished fact. He says, I have overcome the world. That is our Savior, the one who has overcome. So, believer today, don't be glum. Don't be heavy-hearted. Don't be downcast. Don't let your knees knock together. Don't let your hands hang low and limp. Lift them up in praise to God. For though there is trial, tribulation in this world, we can be of good cheer. For our Savior, our Lord, has overcome Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is terrible. Other translations use a different word, but I think I like that word terrible. To the child of God, to the one who is trusting in the Lord, he is unspeakably beautiful. But to those who resist his ways, to those who fight and kick and rebel, to those who, like the man Saul, Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, who are kicking against the pricks and against the goads, our Lord is most terrible. And we read, he is a great king over all the earth. This is repeated in a few verses farther along. And that means it's absolutely sure and true. And it means that we need to pay attention to this. He is indeed a great king over all the earth. As it repeats in verse 7. He is a great king, not just over your little bit of territory, but over all the earth. This world was sold into sin in the Garden of Eden. This world fell into sin, not just Adam and Eve, but collectively all of us together. And the whole of creation, as Paul speaks, it fell into sin and has suffered the devastating effects. But through the cross of Calvary and Old Testament saints, they looked forward to what Christ would do on Calvary in the confident hope that God was going to fulfill his word, and certainly he has, we, from our vantage point, look back upon what was done. They looking forward, we looking back, each of us by faith, trusting in what God planned to do and did in fact do. This is our confidence. 
and what was sold into sin, Christ has redeemed through his own blood. Verse 3, he shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. This is the promise of our God and the greatness. He is working out his plan. The devil and all of his demons shall not prevail. The last word has not been spoken. He, verse 4, shall choose our inheritance for us. Have you ever considered someone who sold themselves short? God, it says here, is the one who chooses our inheritance for us. Some people, they just can't dream big enough. They can't dream to know what heaven is going to be like. They can't imagine the glories. And so they fritter away their spiritual heritage here, not knowing that if they wait just a little while longer, dear friend, what riches there are in glory. What riches. We think of the man Esau, how that he sold his birthright for a, a mess of a meal. How that later, though he sought for repentance, he just couldn't find it. He had frittered away something of inestimable value for just one single meal that was gulped down in a few moments of time. I'm glad that God has chosen our inheritance, that he's the one who is setting it all up for us rather than we ourselves. Verse 5 says, God is gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. And I think back to how that this throne of David and the throne of Solomon especially is described in glorious terms. But I think that surpassing any earthly throne of this world, the throne of God and how that he has gone up, how that he has ascended, and how that he has gone up with a shout, a shout of praise, both from the believers of earth and from the angelic host. You think, round about the fields of Bethlehem, how that the sky was suddenly filled and the shepherds, were absolutely dazzled with the angelic host who appeared to announce the coming of Jesus. Glory to God in the highest. God who has gone up with the angelic shout. That is also ever so glorious. And we are bid to join in the praise God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. And verse 6 says, the sons of Korah, they say, sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our king. Sing praises. And why would we not extol such a great and a mighty God? Verse 7, for God is the king of all the earth. There it is repeated from verse 2. And we have sing ye praises with understanding. With understanding. I want to take you to Romans chapter 4. And here is something that arrests my attention repeatedly. Is the believer one who lacks understanding or is the believer one who has greater and even surpassing understanding? I vote and I declare to you that the believer is the one who perceives more realities than any atheist or agnostic will ever hope to. I consider that Abraham, 
who was looking for a son to be born to him. God had said, Abram, you're going to have a son and he, he'll be born by the woman you married, the woman Sarah. Now this was a bit of a problem because Abram, he was coming into his 90s and Sarah, she was into her 80s and you don't need to be steeped in medical science in order to understand that if you've never had a child, that's not the time to start. And even if you have had a family, unlikely at best that a couple in their 80s and 90s are going to be blessed with any more children. But in Romans chapter 4, verse 16, Paul declares, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only, or not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, trusting in God's grace. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. God is the one who says that it shall be and it is. It is. Verse 18, talking about Abraham, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Verse 19 especially. And being not weak in faith, not being weak in faith, Abraham considered his own body now dead, Abraham wasn't, well, you know, I'm as likely to have a child as anybody. He realized, he knew how it usually worked. But without becoming weak in faith, he considered his own body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He was one who was clapping his hands and praising God and saying, sing praises to our God for what he promised he shall accomplish. It's recorded of Abraham in Genesis that he believed God he believed what God had said to him, even though everything else was counter. He simply grabbed a hold of what God had said to him. And God credited, credited. He put it down in his spiritual bank account that Abraham was righteous. It was imputed to him for righteousness. Sing praises with understanding. We take and we understand that God is indeed a great God. We come to his word and we soak in God's word and we lap it up and we take it to ourselves and we gain understanding that what we see in this world is not all that there is, but we see in God's word that he is indeed a great king and so how can we be glum? How can we be heavy-hearted except for those who have not yet come to the Lord? For he has chosen our inheritance, and it is great, and it is glorious. And he is the one who rules over all, and he is the one who sitteth upon the throne. Verse 8 says, God reigneth over the heathen. Those who fight and kick against him he is their God, though they shall not share in any inheritance. 
He is yet the judge over all. He is the God over all the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, together even the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is, he is, he is, he is greatly exalted. Lord, Thank you for this psalm of rejoicing, which I believe is for our day and something we need to consider in our time. So, Lord, may this sink into our hearts and that we indeed sing praises with understanding. Lord, so continue your work and draw men and women unto yourself We ask and pray in Jesus' name, amen.